Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tech and Tech Podcast. I'm John Wharton. And I'm Dean Reverman. You're Dean. Uh, it's, you know, we, we often talk about the future. Yes. You know, like looking to the future, yes. especially in an industry we with a big love technology. Talking about right. Focus. Yes. <laughs> we look ahead all the time. Tech is intertwined with innovation. What's yes. new? Yes. What's next? What's next? But sometimes it is important to talk a little bit about where we've been as well. Ah, you know, yes. a little context. Yeah, look, yes. look back mm-hmm. a little bit, mm-hmm. reflect, because mm-hmm. that can sometimes be a way to help you understand better about where you might be going or understand that the things you think are just a now problem are right. actually problems that are it's been around for quite some of, time. Yeah. Part yes. of every, you know, yeah. decade or two. Stop you know, freaking anyway. out. We've been been yeah, through this before. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so today we have a special <laughs> guest with us to talk a little bit about Reflect and Share on his experiences. It's Dave Judy from Code. Uh, He's retiring soon. Ah. Uh, and I don't know, for some reason, he wants to spend part of his last days talking to us. I <laughs> <laughs> Not sure why, but okay, you know, we'll we'll t- we'll take it. We'll take the industry uh, knowledge exactly. for sure. So, so he's going to share some of his experiences, which I think can help us understand a little bit about, you know, again, why how tech may change, mm-hmm. challenges may change, business goals may change, mm-hmm. resellers mm-hmm. and what they do may change, but. Mm-hmm. A lot of those changes are stuff that, again, is kind of cyclical and may happen over and over again. And maybe you yeah. can give us a little insight into like, hey, you know, this stuff that we're freaking out about now, well, we freaked out about something similar a decade ago. Uh, and I love got it. got through that or two decades Sage ago. Sage advice. That that's what we have coming. Exactly. Yes. So uh, so that's that's what we're getting into today. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, his time in the business, what he's learned from in mm-hmm. the, the B2B technology industry. Mm-hmm. He's going to share some lessons with us, things that can maybe help us grow, you know, professionally and personally. Nice. nice. Uh, he's going to Talk about an interesting little project he's working on because you know how it is. You know, we even if you're retiring, you still got stuff you want to do. Oh God, yeah. And he's got a cool yeah. little project that he's working hey, on. Yeah, I was going to yeah. talk a little bit about, yeah. and then give some advice to the next generation coming up in this channel. Which Perfect. Is also not us at this point either. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all that plus your usual value to the VAR. What's tech connecting with us? It's time to plug in and get connected. Welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. It's time to get connected. All right, as I mentioned today, our guest is Dave Judy. He is a senior regional sales manager for Code Corporation, which is a Brady company now. Yes. Uh, so, so Dave, great partner. Let's let's kick this out here by by talking a little bit about you. Give us the rundown of your career. You've been at it for a while, but you've also been in this industry for a good long time too. So, give us the background of your career and and, and how you got to where you are. All right. Well, first of all, I, I probably in the technology business, I've been with Code for about twenty years. Uh, and that was a career change, complete career change, uh, career path change for me. Uh, prior to that, I had been in uh, the retail business and I'd done that for 20 years. And then I got into some retail sales for about 10 years after that and uh, went to college actually when I was uh, 40 years old, went back to college and uh, finished my degree at 45 and and then went into the technology area and the idea that I was, I was going to become a, a coder, a programmer. That was what my education was, was le- leaning towards and uh, kind of discovered that really no one wanted to hire a 45 year old programmer. So uh, I, I morphed into a, a, an application engineer position with code right off the bat. And it's just, it was love at first bite, so to speak, you know, they kind of throw you in there and you you got to learn the bits and the bytes. And I kind of have an engineering brain uh, to begin with. So, you know, I think about things rather than people. And, and it was a good fit. And after three years as an application engineer, Code kind of switched their direction on how we were handling sales. And we put on a direct sales uh, team. And I had had some sales experience uh, just prior to Code. So they asked me if I wanted to be part of the sales team. And I did. Um, and I and I was pretty good at it because I discovered that um, sales, even though most people think of in terms of hard sales, you know, you've got to go out and you've got to knock on the doors and you got to convince somebody to buy something. Uh, you know, I, I kind of discovered that because of my background and how much I knew about barcode readers and barcodes and the, the whole workflow process that goes along with uh, barcodes and barcode readers, I was much better salesperson when I tried to explain how barcodes readers worked, what barcodes were used for, how they could help in their workflow, and just came at uh, the sales process 
as a teacher rather than as a salesperson. And that approach worked very well for me. And, um, you know, when people come to you and ask you questions, knowing that you're not really interested in, in turning a sale that day, then, then they're more interested in talking to you about how to solve their problems. Cause that's really kind of what it's all about. So, like I said, 20 years with codes, been doing, been uh, a very good uh, career for me. I've loved every minute of it. There's been a lot of changes in the industry, a lot of maturation on some of the verticals that we've uh, been involved with. So we've had to change things uh, in the way that we do things. And, and uh, it's just been a very, very satisfying career. Yeah. I always love the stories of, and I feel like we get these a lot where you talk to somebody about their past, like, mm-hmm. well, I didn't start off in yeah, right. technology, yeah. you know, industry, Just but stumbled into kind this. of ended up here yeah. in some way. Yeah. And I also appreciate the idea of the, the going back to school when you're a little bit later in life. I did the same thing. I, you know, I didn't take my opportunity as deeply in, in mm-hmm. as, uh, you know, uh, concernedly as I should have when mm-hmm, I was younger, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. went back in my thirties, you know, to, to finally flesh out my degree. And I, you know, I think it's that, that important lesson of like, Hey, you know, if, if you miss your opportunity, there's still the opportunity to go back and do it. Yeah. And, right. we, and to be honest, I think I probably had an easier time of it than oh, I would sure. have back in my twenties yeah, anyway. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Definitely more focused, uh, when you go back to school than some of the younger kids are and stuff. Yes. <laughs> what well, it helped too. Like I was doing like a business degree. I remember like kind of feeling like there's times that I was sort of, you know, teaching the class a little bit like, Oh, <laughs> I've kind of been in business actually for a few years and now yeah. I just am trying to do this. So hold my beer me, professor. Yeah, me, I got this one. <laughs> let, me tell you, let me tell you about some of the things that I know about too. So. Right, yeah. Uh, all right. Well, hey, that's a that's a great history and a great background, and obviously lends credence to your you know your your time in the channel. I mean, again, even twenty years mm-hmm. is a lot of time in this particular industry for things yeah. to have changed and grown oh, and for sure and yeah. different, you know, than than where they used to be. Yeah. So you know, let's talk about that. Let's talk about your your time in B two B technology with code and and with with you know and and again, I like that you've had kind of the you know, some of the, the, the data, the background, the kind of technical experience, and then also on the sales side too, mm. you know, what kept you going with this? What kept you at code for this time? What kept you in this industry? What are some of the more, and then what are some of the more like significant and unexpected changes that you've encountered along the way that you didn't expect to happen in this industry? Well, I think what kept me in it is just, um, the idea there's, there's, two different areas that code's always been involved with in SAR, as far as sales process. We love the channel. In fact, I was the first channel manager for code. Um, uh, I remember knocking on blue stars doors, uh, very early on, you had no idea who we were and trying to get you guys to pay attention to who we were. Cause we understood that in order to sell through the channel that, you know, you were a big part of that. So, you know, I was part of that, uh, that, transition from a direct sales company to a, a channel sales company right from the very beginning and, and going out and finding resellers who uh, were involved in barcode reading industry of some some way, some form, and then trying to get them to understand who code was and what we did and why we were a little bit different. And then also because of our background in, in the direct sales channel early on, we maintain a lot of those relationships with the end users. And we love that because we get a chance to talk to them, to hear what their problems are. So that was always very interesting to me to, to be able to handle both sides, not only the channel, but also on the end user. And that was uh, that was something that was very, very fulfilling to me. I could walk into a customer. I didn't have to worry, an end user. I didn't have to worry about them buying the product. All I had to worry about was helping them solve their problem. So that kind of took the pressure of sales off of my shoulder once they got to the point where they uh, agreed that that code was a good fit for them and we were a good uh, fit for them as, uh, or they were a good fit for us, then um, they could buy through whatever channel partner they had and we just helped facilitate that sale at that point in time. So that was always very interesting to me. Now, as you are probably aware that the majority of our uh, sales are, are, are with healthcare. Uh, we are huge in the healthcare industry. Uh, we, we are indeed all of our products that we sell in the healthcare for healthcare. Uh, we didn't try to take a retail product or an industrial product and plug it into healthcare. We, we did just the opposite. We figured out what healthcare wanted. And so, um, my relationships with, uh, with the healthcare industry has been very strong and, and, and long, but as a tech, as an application engineer, when I first started with code, we were, I worked with everybody and I, and I actually found working with those hard to, uh, solve 
problems that every reseller has that they're just looking and sometimes for a long time for solutions for <clears throat> for their customers uh, I found those fascinating I, I love walking in saying okay what can we do what do they need to have done what can we do is there is there a middle ground here where we can work together and in the the nice thing about that was that not only are you solving an end user problem but you're kind of helping the reseller become the hero and and they love that and so that was always a good partnership with both the end user and the reseller. So, you know, there's been enough in this business is, you know, because it's been so fascinating on how to integrate barcode readers into workflow challenges that it's, it's kept me very on point and, and interested in the industry. You know, when you, when you think about it, I, I love that phrase that, that you had there, hard to solve problems, because that's, that's what the channel is all about, right? Mm-hmm. In the sense that, mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes you got to figure stuff out. There is no easy answer along the way, but but the channel and through the ecosystem uh, has been has been there. And and I I think probably you could probably comment uh, here a little bit in the sense that you know the maturation as as you mentioned. You know I think the industry has matured significantly. Uh, obviously, while you've been around in it, right, Dave? Uh, seen a lot of maturity through there. And 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 again, I think it's. What what I love about the channel is is you know there is no problem that's unsolvable. We just need to roll up our sleeves and get in there and do it, as opposed to other ones, other parts of the channel maybe, or it's just easy sales. Right, you know, like right. oh, you just need this software right here. Here's a license for it, and if you don't need it, go away. Right. <laughs> or but but here, you know, what's the challenge? Oh, okay, well, we got to figure this out. We got to roll up our sleeves. We got to we got to do that. And uh, uh, it's nice being in a mature type of technology to enable that. You think, Dave? Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, there's still challenges because, um, you know, when you're trying to integrate technology into a workflow, it, it's not always a cut and paste type of environment. Sometimes you're having to do things customization wise that, that will allow that that device that you're trying to integrate in there to work seamlessly with what they're trying to do on a workflow. Uh, is I, I'm more in a training position now than I'm in a sales position, but I, I, I try to tell everybody that I talk to, it's, it, it's not about putting a barcode reader in a desk any longer and say, here you go, next best thing to slice bread. It's how can I save you money in your workflow? You know, seconds add up to dollars. And, and if I can shave a few seconds off a workflow process by doing this simple little adjustment in, within the barcode reader, you know, the, the ROI is huge. And comment a little bit because you, you, you mentioned the code strong in healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as, as we or as I t- kind of take a step back, I'm, I'm always fascinated to see where barcode technology has manifested itself out in, out in the world you know what what are some other industries or verticals that you maybe you're surprised by the growth or the application whether it's within healthcare or outside of healthcare that's like oh well you know yeah i guess it applies over here but i don't know do you have any comments there and maybe some uh, surprise growth areas that's a good question um so i i guess what l- let me just talk about first what we what we discovered in healthcare and and how that might apply. In healthcare, they have no control over the barcodes that are coming in. They have no control over uh, the the size of the packaging that's coming in. They have very little control over any of those things that that they require to have barcodes on them, other than NDC codes on drugs are are pretty standard. but the type of barcode, what uh, the size of the barcode, the me- media that the barcode printed are printed on, are, uh, hospitals have no control over that whatsoever. So whatever barcode reader they choose had to be good at, at everything. And, and so from a, a broader perspective, what we learn uh, in healthcare and how we dealt with the healthcare issues are really transferable to many, many other industries out there. There's a lot of industries that control absolutely every aspect of what's coming in their door. But those industries that don't, you know, we we are very well situated to help them in, in solving problems where they may not be able to tell a supplier, hey, you need to put this type of barcode on this size of label with this size of font. They just don't have that kind of control over their over their uh, vendors and stuff. So, you know, we, we work really well in those, in those situations. It, does that translate to a specific industry? I, I, you know, I, I don't really, I don't, can't really say that I've seen that, but it, 
generally speaking, you know, because what we do in healthcare uh, is able to be applied in so broadly everywhere else that it, it works out. And that's part of the reason why we see barcodes everywhere now. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like literally everywhere, which is good for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. You know, you, you made a comment, Dave, on the direct sales. And a lot of our audience are ISVs or software development companies that are always interested. You know, they start out in a direct sales model and they're always curious about the channel uh, and what the channel can do for them. Maybe could you go a little deeper there and what, you know, some of the benefits you think of like a software company, you know, getting into the channel and why they should consider, you know, working with partners, working within our ecosystem. Well, I, I, I've been with this company for so long that, um, that a good day when we first started out, we were getting a fax for 10 barcode readers. That was, that was a good day. And that was our direct sales model. You're waiting for somebody to bring you a, an order and stuff. And, you know, you do have a little contact with, with uh, customers. Sometimes your marketing is small and you can't have the outreach. But um, I am a huge fan of the channel. And I think that they have, they have really made our company what it is today. Uh, because without the channel, without those um, people working uh, for resellers and for VARs and everyone else involved in the channel, without their feet on the street, without them looking for a place to put us, without them trying to solve a problem for a customer, we we would probably never be where we are. We'd still be waiting for uh, that fax. For the fax to come in, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, so, you know, it, you can only hire so many direct salespeople and it's never enough to cover the market where when the channel's involved, you've got You've got bodies and feet and brains and hands all over the place. I love yeah. it. That's yeah. it right there. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, I, I really appreciate the sentiment, too, of staying close to your customers and recognizing that even though you're not direct anymore, even though you are part of this channel, that's still mm -hmm. understanding what end customers are doing. it Because I think it's sometimes something in this channel that if you're not careful, you can get a little too far away from them, when mm -hmm. there's, especially at the vendor manufacturer level where, you know, you're, you're there and then you've got a distributor like this, mm -hmm. then you've got the reseller yep. and then you've got the end customer. Maybe yep. you got an ISV stuck in there somewhere in the middle too. Yeah. A lot of layers between what you're doing and the folks that are eventually actually going to use your products and I think it could be easy sometimes to be like, well, the channel's taking care of that, so I can back away from mm, those end mm -hmm, customers. Mm -hmm. But it, it, I mean, I think it makes you better at making products. It makes you better at positioning products. It makes you better at helping us as a distributor and then the you resellers. You mean to stay connected. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. understand, to still like live and breathe in the life yeah. of the end user. And yeah. I think healthcare is that perfect example of that because – I feel like healthcare is one of those industries that everybody wants a piece of it because right. there's, there's a lot of <laughs> so money much there. Money, yeah. Yeah. Everyone's Trillions, like, man, yeah. I want to get in there. Right. But they don't think about like, all right, what do I need to actually do? Because mm. trust me, everyone wants to get in there mm. and they're all throwing out their ideas and trying to market and mm -hmm. knocking on doors or trying to wiggle their way into that industry in some way. But most of them are just like, all right, I'm, I'm going to beat the door. And if you open it, I'm just going to scream at you what I've got and hope that you <laughs> open a little further. When in reality, you've got to understand, just like you said, you understand a little bit more about who they are, what they want, what actually matters to them. Mm -hmm. And then that's, I mean, and granted, that works in any industry, but I think healthcare in particular is one where if you don't at least understand who they are and what they're dealing with, they have no reason to open the door to you because there, again, are dozens and dozens, hundreds even, yeah. of companies that are trying to do the exact same yeah. thing that you potentially are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, the healthcare's changed as well in that, you know, uh, workflows have have been modified. They've been uh, they they've ex uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? They've evolved to the point where you know what they started out with as far as technology may not be the best choice any longer. And and you know our involvement with end users gives us the opportunity to even if they're not a, a current customer, it gives us an opportunity to present what we've brought to the industry and how we've helped their workflow and saved their nurses time or money and, um, and, and made sure things were better for their patients. Uh, whereas a, a, a reseller who's, or a, a VAR who's working with a healthcare, there is a tendency to, to not want to upset the apple cart. And if a, if a, if a reseller is comfortable selling a hospital, a particular product, and they've been selling it to them for years, 
they may not always be doing their customer, the hospital, the, the biggest benefit by showing them what's new and what's progressed within their uh, within their industry as well. So I, I know they, they want to, but sometimes it's just easier to keep selling what they've always been selling. So we like to have uh, direct interaction with, with healthcare because we can present new things. We can also ask them where they think our technology should be going and what we should be building in order for being ready for that next cutting edge uh, change in their industry that, that they're, they're also looking for. It enables the solution, right? When yeah. you have hardware manufacturers like Code, you know, out there with their with deep knowledge of what's going on in the industry, well, that enables them from a product standpoint yep. to excel there and let the channel deal with, you know, the relationships and finding right, the new right. one and all those kinds of good things. Yep. At least arms yeah, you with like, that. I like that term solution because that's, you know, that's what ultimately we're trying to get to is a solution. And it may be an integrated solution, but it's an and rarely is it just a new barcode reader. Changing technology from one manufacturer to another is is costly. You know, we, we recognize that. And, and when a company or a, a hospital is looking to make a change, it's not just the cost of the barcode reader any longer. It's, it's the cost of, of all the cabling. It's the cost of the mounting. It's the cost of the fixtures. It's cost of the labor that it takes to change everything out. It's not insignificant at all. So we we're very cognizant of that. And we're, if there's a change that need to be made, you know, there, it it needs to be done in a way that, or the decision needs to be made because it's the best thing to do and for long term on the, in the hospital. Well, let's uh, let's open this conversation a little bit broader. And and you know, and, and again, you've had all this time in business and industry in general, and just your time in the workforce and everything you've probably learned over time. So, maybe give us some some fundamental lessons that you've learned. You know, uh, that's helped you succeed over time. Whether whether it's been with code in this industry or even your time in retail before that, what's some of the stuff that's helped you grow professionally or personally during that time? Um, I think one of the things as I reflect back that, that I've learned that made the biggest impact is that I, I, I'm not a person who likes to be in the front of the crowd or the front of the line or, you know, being the focus of anything. I've learned about my personality a long time ago. I'm, I'm much better at, at being part of a team or supporting someone. So I learned early on that that if I made my my superiors, my boss look good, if I made a customer look good, I didn't need to take credit for that. They knew who who helped them with that, and and not worry about taking credit for something as opposed to making sure that the people who were seeking that solution or or in charge of making those decisions got the credit as they deserved and stuff. So that that's helped taking a lot of pressure off of me. Once I realize it's not about me and it's more about, you know, helping somebody else succeed. I, I found that if I help my bosses succeed, they kind of pull me up with them. Absolutely. And, you know, so what, you know, on that note, what, talk a little bit about the importance of like you continuously training or, you know, being knowledgeable about what's going on in the marketplace and things of that nature in order to be, you know, that good steward, if you will, and kind of behind the scenes, it takes it takes a, a, a little bit of learning, right? Training on, ongoing and things of that nature. Yeah, um, I'm not quite sure I'm following your question on that. Can you expand that a little bit? Yeah, so like, you know, I, I wonder to myself, okay, so like if if I see my role as being, you know, kind of an advisor and things of that nature, I want to be involved in what's happening in the marketplace and continuously train on, on those types of things. What are the new technologies that are out there? What are the new softwares being brought into that? Have you found that that's, it's necessary to kind of keep your thumb on the pulse of what's happening in the industry and, and then being able to apply those things, especially when you get into solution selling, right? In, in order to understand the solution, you have to know the components that are going into that. So I, I just imagine it would be important to, you know, that's just my, my personal thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you might as well stay continuously trained on that stuff and, and, and just have it in your DNA to kind of con continuously learn. Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree. I, I'm probably not as good as keeping up on the software and stuff like that as, as other people are. Uh, but what I'm more focused on is, is listening to what the customer's problems are, paying attention to what they're saying not being so fixed on trying trying to tell them my solution to the, their problem as listening to what their problem is and then trying to 
tweak or, or rebalance my products to fit what they're trying to do. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's the days of slapping a barcode reader on a desk and saying, this is the next best thing to slice bread are over. And, and, uh, when we can find when I've been able to, when I've been the most successful is when I've been able to take what we have and, and modify it somehow so that it's a perfect fit for what the customer is trying to do, because ultimately that's their perspective. That's what they have something that they're trying to do. I don't have something I'm trying to fit into them. They're trying to tell me what they need and I'm trying to modify what, what I've got to fit within their vision, not what my vision is for what they should be doing. You know, and on that point, Dave, do you think it's important because you, you've, you've got kind of the sales aspect and the product management stand, uh, aspect, do you think it's important for sales to give feedback back to the product folks on what they're hearing in the marketplace? And is that an important part of the feedback loop so that products can advance and, and whatnot? Oh, it's critical. Absolutely critical. It can't, you know, you can, we've, we used to make the mistake of trying to have our, um, our engineers and software people design a product and, and it was all really cool. You know, they, they did a great job, but it wasn't what the customer wanted. And so you have to integrate, uh, not only what salespeople are hearing, but what the customers are, are saying. We have a very extensive voice of the customer program here at Code where, you know, we don't make anything without talking to X amount of customers about what they're doing, what they want to have done and, and take a look is, is this product and these and these features that we've got that we're thinking about. What do you think about those kind of things? So that feedback for a, a successful product it, it is absolutely critical. We, you, you can't really launch a product based off of what engineers think that product should be. It's got to be based off of what not only customers, but the industry, you know, where the industry is going. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that for the last 10 years, Code has really paid attention to the customers. You know, we've, we've had some launches of products that we salespeople going, yeah, you, you, you think we can sell that? And it doesn't always work out very well because it's an engineer-based product and not a, a, a customer-focused product. Yeah, I agree. I think that's good advice. I mean, when, when, you, when you think about resellers out there, I mean, maybe some of them or some sales reps on the resellers, you know, they think they're in a box and they don't really engage with the ecosystem. I'm glad to hear you say that, Dave, because to me, it's it's always been beneficial to to have that camaraderie, that feedback that's happening out there. I mean, as a sales representative, you know, typically you're on the front lines, right? Mm -hmm. And so the feedback that you can report back, uh, depending on, you know, how, um, what your business acumen is of feedback, you know, oh, our product sucks in this way. You know, no, that's not, you don't want to tell a product engineer that they're doing what, what they do sucks, but um, you know what I mean? Right. But I mean, you, you know, there's just, but that feedback's so important for, yeah. especially yeah. in solution selling that we're getting into more and more these days. You have to learn. You have to apply. You have to give that feedback to back to the people that can do something about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I very much appreciate also your attitude of like it's not about me. It's not about mm, me trying right. to be at the front and getting all the credit and the pats yeah. on the back or whatever. You know, yeah. it's it's about what the customers ultimately want and what they need. Mm -hmm. And I also appreciate too the idea of look, you don't have to be the absolute expert in everything. No. Uh, and, and, Who you know, is? And, I know, exactly. Very <laughs> few people actually are. Right. Sometimes, especially when you're a salesperson, sometimes the best thing you can be doing is asking a lot of questions, doing a lot of listening, gathering a lot of information, and then when you're done, making sure that they know that you listened, mm -hmm. that you've got the right information, clarifying what you need to clarify, mm -hmm. and then basically telling them, like, hey, you know what? I've got brilliant people that are working with me that I'm going to go take this back to, and I'll be back you know, tomorrow or next week with a solution to exactly what your what what your problem is yeah, here. Yeah. And I think sometimes there's there's too many people that try to they they don't they try, they try to skip that middle portion mm. there. They try to be like, all right, well, I've got someone on the phone. That's I've got to I'm figure saying. this out right, right now. Yeah, I've got to yeah, give yeah. them a solution right now. Mm -hmm. So I'll give them the first thing that popped in my head or whatever the hot new product is mm -hmm. that I'm told that we need to go out and sell. Mm -hmm. And I'll just shove it across the table and say, this is what I think you need. Even though you may not have actually bothered to ask the right kind of questions, you didn't listen enough, you weren't paying enough attention, and that comes across to customers. People mm -hmm. recognize when they're being sold to right. versus Rather when than, you're being a consultant yeah, and being yeah. a, an and advisor trying, of exactly. some sort. Yeah. So I think that's, that's a, good it, stuff. 
there's a term that I like to uh, term that I like to use. It's short term sales versus long term sales. I mean, everybody is you know when you've got a quota to fulfill this month, you're you're chasing short term sales and stuff. That may be a one time sale if if you're not presenting the right product. I was always fortunate with code in that uh, when we were uh, held responsible for our sales, it wasn't on a month to month basis. It was on a year to year basis. So as long as I came in at the end of the year where I needed to be, I, I was good. So I, I was focused on long term sales and, and a lot of that's repeat sales. And so I always knew that when I uh, developed my my um my territory, if I de developed it wide with a, a lot of mix of new customers and existing customers, I was always going to be good. So, you know, you can, you can go for that short-term sale and, and, and that might be the only sale you get out of it, or you can take the approach, I want a long-term customer and, and keep that customer coming back to you year after year, not only to sell products that you've been selling them, but because you've become a trusted advisor at that point, they're going to come to you for advice in the future. That was always more important to me than that short-term sale. Yep. And the, and the way to make that mature is to keep that e ecosystem happy yep. or, and, and healthy, you know, with yeah. feedback and things of that nature. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Yeah. Well, Dave, as I mentioned up at the top of the show, just because you're retiring doesn't mean you're not still working on stuff or don't have exciting new things. You're not just coasting to the finish line here. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't blame you if you did, because trust me, it sounds appealing to me sometimes, too. But but you got a project that you're working on. Uh, Emily Scales, uh, your marketing person over there at Code, when she you know recommended you for the show, said, hey, you need to talk to Dave about his his digital driver's license. Licensing project. So, Ooh, what's that? Tell us, yeah, tell us what what is that? What are you hoping to accomplish, and what's what's happening next on the project? So, we could probably kill two birds at the same time uh, with something that is happening, and also new technology at the same time here. So, uh, digital driver's licenses are are starting to be uh, adopted throughout the United States uh, and Canada and uh, Utah, for, which was where we are, uh, are one of the first states that have implemented a digital driver's license. And it's, uh, it, you, you all have your physical driver's license where you have your picture on the front and there's a barcode on the back. Uh, a digital driver's license, because of the security uh, aspects of, uh, or lack of on the, the card driver's licenses, the digital driver's license uh, adopted a, a very, uh, very much higher uh, security feature set. So when you, have a digital driver's license, there's a barcode there and that barcode changes every 30 seconds, at least with the, 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 the one we're working with here. And it's a token. It's not the actual barcode like you'd see on your high, uh, on your, your digital or in your card driver's license. So when you have this, this, um, token, you scan this token and then it takes it and does a verification process. And then it, once verified, it goes out to the state's uh, database and pulls the information right from the state's database. And it's a kind of a two pronged process for us. You have the barcode reader, which reads that barcode. And then you, we have a, a piece of software that we developed that goes out and does the validation. And uh, the, in, in the digital driver's license world, the, the way it's set up right now is that when you uh, have your digital driver's license, uh, there's a mobile device that the um, the retailer or the TS, uh, TSA people have that they scan it and then you are able to then uh, validate that that barcode and see that that yeah that person is the right person it, it, and it, that mobile device that's been used out there it's kind of falling short of what the industry needs. Because if you think in terms of uh, any uh, in Utah here at bars or restaurants or liquor stores that sell alcohol, then how many check stands do you have that you're going to need to be able to uh, to do to validate that digital driver's license? And currently, uh, every mobile device that's out there, uh, it's got to be owned by the store or the, the the establishment in order to do that. And and it's an expensive prospect when you think, okay, I've got five check stands, do I need five mobile devices? And if I can't afford five mobile devices, 
what do I do then? I still have to validate this driver's license. So we've stepped up with um, our 5200 CR5200 barcode reader, made it, uh, which is our, our, our presentation barcode reader, made it not only able to scan the card driver's license as well as any of the, the, the soft or hard goods that are coming through. Uh, you scan those and they just ring up like regular items, but then you have your driver's license for age restricted products, scan your hard card driver's license, and it tells you if you're age appropriate to buy those things. And then it communicates back to the point of sale system that, yeah, you, it is, this person is legal and satisfy the, um, the security requirements of the point of sale system. But the mobile driver's license has kind of created a conflict there because now you have a secondary device that, that is uh, has the the mobile verification application on it, but there's no direct connection to the point of sale system. So we we've, we've created a back end software that the 5200 recognizes that it's a mobile driver's license, scans it, goes into our uh, application, runs the API in order to uh, validate that mobile driver's license pulls that information from whatever state that driver's license is from and sends it back to the point of sale system just as if it was a hard card driver's license. So we're able to communicate uh, both with uh, the, uh, the, the person who's validating that driver's license, mobile driver's license, because we do a pop-up that shows the image of the person that owns that driver's license as well. We get that from the state. So now, now they have a, 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 ver a positive verification that the picture on their screen is the person that's holding that mobile driver's license. It, it's worked really well. It's very new still. It's in the implementation process, but we're, we're really happy about the direction it's going. And, and uh, we see a lot of upside uh, for us on this because we're, we're kind of unique. We've kind of crossed that bridge between uh, – a commercial need and and the ideological setup that the the mobile driver's license people are are initially are proposing. That sounds like a cool solution. Now, yeah. how hard would it, the install be, though? Are you expecting you know for the reseller to go in and this is a bolt-on API, right? So, in the sense that um, you know, is are you gearing it towards really any reseller who has a little bit of capabilities would be able to integrate this fairly easily into the POS? Yeah. No, actually, it's it is a almost a standalone application. Ah, you, I see. You just download the application, and and we work seamlessly because the the POS systems generally are taking USB uh, data. In other words, you know, you can enter in if you have a keyboard, you can enter in the birth date. Uh, if you've got a barcode reader that's set up or or integrates with the point of sale system you scan the barcode on a card we, that barcode reader pulls out the birth date off the card and then sends only it to the point of sale system with the mobile driver's license. All we're doing is in the background is doing that validation process and then taking that same information that the point of sale system already needs for their security features and then just plugging that in. So it's, it's it, the nice thing is there's, and that is one direction that some of these companies are going. They're trying to get uh, point of sale ISVs to integrate the capability of doing the validation themselves. But we've kind of taken it uh, offline and say, okay, we can do that for you on the barcode reader side. All you need to have at this point in time is a Windows application that you can run our our little application in the background at. Brilliant. Man, yep, makes this. sense. Now, from a from a, from a re channel perspective. Uh, it's it's licensed sales. You know, you're, it's, it's, a, it's a software license that you sell to uh, the retailers out there. We're still working on pricing on stuff on that, but you know, that's those are all problems that we're we're working to solve, and, and uh, I I expect that we'll have those things wrapped up pretty soon. Very that's nice, fantastic. Yep, I cool. can tell you're you're passionate about this, and and I like the idea of this because I'm ready to finally get rid of my wallet. Oh yeah, I feel like you know we can make mobile payments. Do you have one of those Costanza wallets? By the way, you know uh, what I'm talking it's about. It's not is that it, bad. Okay. Like yeah. I try not to to fill it up with that much stuff, but it's still bigger than I would like to be for something shoved. You're in ready my to back go pocket. full digital, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because mm -hmm. I can do digital payments now. You can do loyalty cards. Yeah, you can get your sure. tickets for you know the airport or yeah. concerts or events yeah. or whatever yep. on there. Like, yeah. I feel like you know the driver's license has been the one thing that you just yeah. couldn't you know yeah. digitally have on your phone to just leave your wallet at home and feel free going to. I still think I would have a hard time doing it. I'd be like. Yeah. Feel weird not having still my need something wallet. Yeah. in there, right? Yeah. 
exactly. So yeah. uh, I, I guess it'd be at this point, you know, the same way as like, I feel weird if I go somewhere without my phone. So, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I think this is some cool, innovative new technology that hopefully is, uh, finds its way out there, uh, you know, nationwide, not just some limited states and countries at this point. Mm-hmm. So good stuff. Yeah. So there's, um, uh, a, a website you can go to, um, and on the, it's the Anvil website that will show you how many states are have adopted or have some sort of adoption for a mobile driver's license. And I think there's about a dozen right now. It'll grow. But but there's nearly every state out there is, has got some sort of legislative action going on to accept or, or adopt a digital driver's license. I'm sure. I feel like this yeah. is one of those things that like as, you know, the younger generation oh, takes yeah. over. It's just, not, it's yeah. going to become commonplace. Have it's going to, to be have. expected. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Everything yeah. revolves around our devices. Yes. So. Yeah. Tying your phone to one more thing. Right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. 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 For good or ill. I thought, yeah, that's, that's, that's what we're doing, I guess. So, all right. Well, hey, we'll wrap up here in a moment with Dave telling a little bit more advice for some of the younger next ah, generation yes. coming up in our channel. All right. Uh, but first wanted to quickly take a moment to thank, as always, our sponsors here on the Tech Connect podcast. We appreciate all the folks that uh, sponsor the show, sponsor our Tech Connect program, yes. and they're, thereby are also supporting the podcast as well. Mm-hmm. If you like the show, we need to hear from you. At the same call out I give every week, I need likes, I need subscribes, I need reviews, <laughs> reviews. Yes. I need screenshots sent to yes. me, whatever you need. I don't care. Comments left behind. Uh, d- d- any of those things, if you take a quick moment and do those things, believe it or not, it, it does help out very much. It helps with all those algorithm things when someone's leaving reviews and comments and this likes. That's true. Yeah. Uh, that helps other people find the show. And for that matter, recommend it to someone. If there's someone you work with or, you know, uh, or even maybe a customer that you feel like, you know, hey, you know, go check out this show, like, yeah. especially minute 12 or something like that. They have a great yeah, conversation right. about X, yeah. and I think you would be yeah. interested in hearing in that. about yes, that. Yeah. Yes, so, yes, yes. And of course, we want to hear from you and what you're interested in hearing about on the show because this is only this show is only as good as what you know we put into it to give to you and what you're getting out of it. So leave us comments, you know, or send us a message about what you want to hear about on the show. There's always a link in the show notes where you can send in your ideas for the show. Mm-hmm. Doing that will get you a Tech Connect podcast t-shirt. t-shirt. We're getting closer to the new t-shirts being oh, printed. Okay. Marco was showing me uh, some new uh, uh, designs, designs yes. and ideas. Mm-hmm, he's got mm-hmm. some. He's got some cool ideas for what he's doing there. So I think we're pretty soon, hopefully, to go to print on those and nice. actually get some new t-shirts out. Can I have if one? Want, uh, I guess so. <laughs> I'll let you have one, uh, but we've got we've got actual listeners. We're going to give some yes, to you yes, first. Yes, yes, so, okay, yes, you know, they get yeah. it first. Yes, yes for <laughs> exactly. sure. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you can always find us. Uh, one, you can find us on Blue Stars LinkedIn page. Uh, there's always recaps of every episode each week. You're welcome to leave comments there, or you can also email us at any time. TechConnect at bluestarinc.com. All right, let's wrap things up here, starting with value to the var. Yes, and this is where you know I, I want Dave to. You know, to, to put on his, you know, transitional hat as, as you're as you're heading out of the industry and you see this new generation coming in and, and taking over. Do you have some advice for those folks coming in that, you know, maybe you know they're they're gung ho about all the new technology, but maybe they're not quite sure about how the channel works just yet. And things maybe you've learned that could be helpful to someone coming in. And I know you mentioned before we went on that, like, you know, you weren't necessarily always up and current with the hottest, newest technology. But Mm. is there anything that if you were still going to go for another 10, 20 years or so that you would be interested in seeing as the new next technology that you think is going to make a big impact on our channel? Well, as far as um, up and coming people who you know are are starting to get into this, I, I I would say if you if you don't look at this as a sales job, but rather as an opportunity to help people and and um, teach them what's going on, I've been so impressed with the younger generations, the people that I've worked with over the years, um, and our current group of regional sales managers who are just so smart and and are really on top of the technology. But none of that really makes any difference in, until you can relate what you've got or what you know to a customer in a way that makes sense to them. So pay attention to your customers. Make sure you're, you're satisfying their needs and not just trying to sell them something you think that they should have. Uh, that That's always been good advice that I've gotten, and, and it seems to have served me well. As far as new technology, and it's not really new, but it's it's kind of coming around. I've always been uh, enamored with uh, RFID stuff, and, and Code's got a, a division of RFID now that we're we're working with. And um, I think there's. I, I remember 15 years ago, um, Walmart was pushing companies to to do something with RFID, and it, it 
has come in fits and starts and it really, you know, it's, it hasn't progressed as well as anybody has thought that it might have by now. But I, and it's not new technology, but I think the technology is finally getting to a point where it's, it's going to start being more and more useful. So I, I, I like RFID a lot. I'm also a little bit intrigued with AI. You know, how how is AI going to help things in our industry and, or how is it going to help your customers? And is there a commercial way of, of, of bringing that through the channel so that, you know, you're, you can present things to your customers that, that will help them and give them the benefit of AI as well? All but, good ones right yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. It, it is the year of RFID. Yes, I think so. I mean, we just we had a conversation about that just a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and I think it's it's time for everyone to start right, taking Dave. it seriously. No, yeah. it is. Yeah, it's 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 not oh, it's not new technology, right. but man, it's starting to. I really... think people are finally starting to get it. Oh yeah, there's there's more and more like Walmart. What was it? Uh, Chris Brown mentioned the the Walmart uh, blast off or whatever yes, that's the pushing blast all these off. other right. retailers yep. to yep. to start requiring it. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, yep. think, I think we're getting there. So. That's good advice right there. All across the board. I agree. Good stuff. All right. Well, hey, let's wrap up as always with what's tech connecting with you. Yes. This is the segment of the show. Where we get to talk about whatever kind of technology, innovation, yes. science, discovery, something that's got our attention. Yep. Uh, Dave, you mentioned earlier that your driver's licensing thing was kind of, you know, something that obviously is a, a, a big tech connecting with you right now. Anything else that you thought of that's that's something you're keeping an eye on? Well, you know, since I'm fading off into the sunset, my my I haven't really been as, uh, as up on new stuff coming out because I've been more worried about getting the uh, the, the driver's license uh, technology going as far as codes go. So uh, I've probably look, been looking more at fly fishing stuff, new technology and fly fishing than I am for technology for the channel, though. Hey, I'm, sure that's there. Been, I'm sure there's been innovation in the world of fly fishing. I mean, it's it's not the same as it used to be. There's a lot a lot more stuff happening there than there used to be in the past. For sure. Indeed. Yes, yeah, yes. And I know you can you can spend a lot of money on some of that technology. Oh, uh, yeah. Meaning, yeah, you get a nice fly reel and oof. If you get, do yeah. like the, the sonar stuff yes. in your boat or whatever yes. to help you track the yes. fish and all that stuff. Yeah. Hey, Dave, Good they stuff. just opened up one of these big Bass Pro shots, like one of these shops, one of the super stores. And I've never yeah. seen so much fishing gear yeah. in my life. Yeah. You can you can spend a paycheck or two of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. There you go. All yep. right. Dean, what's tech connecting? Well, I got one that's appropriate for the industry. Here's okay. the headline. Engineers create the world's smallest QR code. Okay. Embedded pattern with feature sizes close to one thousandth of a millimeter. Wow. All right. So that's that's about as small but as how, you, how are you supposed to have even seen this well, thing to know that you need to scan it? Well, it's only readable by infrared light. Okay. Uh, did I mention okay. that? No, you did not. <laughs> That makes more sense. Like, there you go. I, I, somehow I don't think I'm going to see this thing with my phone camera. Yeah. So. so researchers kind of stumbled into this. They were they were collaborating on trying to understand how some like insects and some animals can kind of morph or or become invisible. Right. You know, you've seen that where their skin can change and it like turns into the background right, kind right. of a thing. It, that, apparently that's called broco, brocosomes or something like Brocosome. that. It's just okay. that magical structure. Like that, brocodosomes. Or right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in, in, in understanding that, uh, they kind of got in off on this little tangent because brocosomes, the way they were, they're like little 3D soccer balls, if you can imagine, um, that when uh, when light hits it, there are certain cavities that absorb that light. Okay. And so they kind of took that and some of the ideas around that. And then if you look at this, this QR code that's created... In essence, you know, they're using these fundamental laws of physics around that, around the structure and how it absorbs energy and things of that nature and creating these little micro environments where, um, you know, certain light is absorbed. And when it does that, it creates a pattern. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, you can you can dictate that and it creates this little itty bitty QR code. So they're going to start, you know, utilizing it. They think that it has applications all over the place. There's security applications and stuff like that. Right. So, but Dave, you might have to stay in the industry a little bit longer because now we need infrared readers, not just laser readers and stuff like that. We need infrared to, to get these many little QR codes that are out there now. 
Good stuff. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see. I, I was like miniaturization. I was thinking it's fascinating, the yeah. stuff that we miniaturize and why. Well, and the, so they've got security. You know, you can camouflage these things. Yeah. You can yeah. you can build them in. Uh, it's 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 a little bit of a fascinating area. Reminds me of like the spy movies where there's like that little, like maybe like a tiny little yes. micro dot yes. sticker on something or whatever that's yes. embedded with like, you know, tons of data and information. Yeah. <laughs> there but it's it is. almost invisible to the naked eye. So. But in this case, you would need an infrared reader to yeah. read it. Right. You know, so a little sli- slightly different technology. Good okay, yeah, I good like stuff. It. All, right. All right, yeah. What's tech connecting with you? All right, so when I, when I say former Disney Channel child star, you probably think of folks that have gone on to like yes. acting and yes. f- singing. You know, like Britney Spears, yes. Ryan Gosling, Selena Gomez. Yeah, all, the list Christina is Aguilera. long. Yeah, lots of folks that have that have gone this different route. Well, yes. What have I told you? There was one though who's actually getting into a an, a, basically a satellite aerospace technology and communication startup. What? Not something you typically would describe no. to your typical <laughs> Disney Channel star, right? Uh, but, you know, these folks can can go and bring They're multi-talented. Too, yes. Not only can they act. Uh, so one in particular, actress and singer Bridget Mendler, who hmm. apparently was a star on such things as Good Luck Charlie, Wizards of Waverly Place, and The oh, Click. Huge one. Now, Wizards of Waverly Place, that's the only one I've actually heard of there. Yeah. But I am familiar with I think Selena Gomez was part of that, too, oh, wasn't yeah. she? Yeah, 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 she yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway. Big so hit in our house. She, mm-hmm. uh, it, you know, did not go the standard route of, like, oh, I'm just going to go off and be a pop star or an actress or something. Right. And just do that, and that's yeah. my career. No. She decided she was going to go study at MIT. Oh, my Lord. And Harvard Law. What? And found a company called Northwood Space. Uh, with her husband, uh, who and, and another investor, who I think went to, um, I can't remember what they're. Oh, they they both work for Lockheed Martin at some point. Okay, so, so rocket scientists. Yeah. Yes. So basically, as she put it in in this article, this is a CNBC article. She, she said that she fell in love with space law, and it got her thinking about things that basically. The, the the fundamental idea of this company is creating more satellite dishes here on Earth, like okay. re, you know receptor dishes. They call them. Uh, it's called the ground stations that they refer to as teleports. Okay. Basically helping connect satellites and making data send faster and easier from Earth to satellites and, uh, and back and forth. Yes, okay. And basically the reasoning behind this is because there are actually very few of these teleports around the world. Mm. And as more and more satellites are yes, up there, as right. more and more space travel is occurring, you've yep. got private space travel now starting to occur. Okay. Lots more data that needs to get transferred from, you know, from terrestrial up into space. These stations are so few of them that like I can they're getting this. booked up essentially. Where it's like if you want to send something, like all right, we well, got to wait six months because everyone else has got us booked up for the next uh, you know five, six months or so. So she's going to create like maybe a mesh of these. So things basically, a, a, a lot of these stations that this company is going to put out together with that are fairly going to be much more affordable than your standard you know mm, giant setup. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit easier to put together. They 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 basically see you know an opportunity to do installs as quickly as like a day to a week. Oh whoa! Where they okay. can get one of these stations gotcha. up and running that somebody could potentially use. And again, and also rather than like, hey, here's like a select group of stations around the world, an individual company that knows Hmm. that they're going to be doing a lot of this Mm -hmm. could potentially have one of these stations on-prem and use it for themselves in order to start sending. Is data this an opportunity there. for farmers? You know how some farmers are turning their fields yeah, into either surprised. cell towers or yeah. wind towers, yeah, or like or we, solar fields and stuff. There you go. Yeah, yeah maybe I, now we can I have wouldn't some. Be surprised some if satellite communications going on go. here. You got some empty space. You and you I know? need to buy some land I, so I that we can start so. taking advantage <laughs> of some of this stuff. No Dave, doubt. you got a farm like, somewhere? <laughs> Is that? Are you retiring to a farm where maybe we can get you a little income here on some satellite communications gear? Well, I'd be up for the additional income, but I have no farm. Okay. <laughs> Say, I don't care how much time and how much progress and innovation changes. The need for land it is never still, goes away. Still huge never goes away. It's still very viable. So That's right. coming soon, Northwood Space. Uh, they're hopefully going to expand the the nature of. Uh, uh, of uh, communications with space. And again, I just think it's fascinating that, you know, Look what well, Disney's you hear, producing. I, yeah, yeah, I feel like you hear about the Disney stars and like you hear about a lot of them that unfortunately are, have troubled, you know, you know, Britney's yeah. had her troubles. Selena, you know, you know, Miley Cyrus whatever, has yeah. been controversial and stuff in of the course, past. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. It's nice to hear about some of them to realize, like, hey, these are folks that, given the right opportunity, could go. Here's the problem: we don't do hear about things. that much. I know that you kind of don't, and, and I and I think it's because, unfortunately, people get the dollar signs in their eyes, you know, yeah. on the parent front and right. the, yeah. the talent front, you know, yeah. the the producer front or whatever. And we're yeah. like, hey, you know, yeah. don't go, don't bother with college. You know, yeah, we can right. get you into yeah. Hollywood and and, <laughs> and get you going there. Make some real money. So, yeah. g- kudos to Bridget Mendler for uh, for kudos doing something all the way. Yeah. for for making her making her bucks in the Disney sphere and then going 
going off and doing something amazing nice. uh, after the fact. There you go. All right, that does it for us today. That's what's tech connecting with us. It is time for us to unplug. Dave Judy from Code, thank Thanks, you so Dave. much for joining us. If we don't speak to you again, enjoy retirement. Hmm. Uh, you know, and, and and don't and resist the urge to keep coming back out of retirement. You know, that's you know, <laughs> go enjoy it. Do that fly fishing, get your driver's license project off the ground and just and go coast through the rest of your life. Enjoy that. Oh, good stuff. <laughs> thank you so much. And as always, folks, please stay connected. Second Act Podcast is brought to you by ELO. Built with versatility in mind, ELO Edge Connect offers a wide assortment of peripheral options for your digital display. Whether for the endless aisle self-order or collaboration, you can seamlessly attach up to four peripherals to the touchscreen edge with the flexibility to add, remove, or change later as needed. I love this stuff. I, mm. just, I love the idea of, like, you got a thing. Yes. Here's some things you can add to the thing. Yes. And it makes the thing better. Yes. <laughs> That's, Just like that's that. That's probably not how Elo would describe it. But, right. want to describe Maybe a little bit more sophisticated than their language. <laughs> Which is why I've got some ad copy here to help yes, out with that. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, but in the end, that's kind of what we're doing. Put a thing on a thing. Yes, yeah, put it, a thing yeah. on a thing and the thing there gets you go. better. All right, let's talk about some of the things that let's you can do. get on. Uh, status lights. Yeah. Temperature sensors. Mm. 3D or conference cameras. Mm. Barcode scanners. Mm-hmm. Card readers. Collaboration tools. Payment cradles. I, as always, I say this, I think, every time we do this ad. Yeah. You can't find peripherals to meet your customers' needs. Yeah. You're not trying. Yeah. Those I don't think got so. You. Yeah. For sure. I yeah. Mean, they, they got you covered there. Yeah. 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 So get can with you, the Edge Connect. Can you hook up like a blender or something like that? Uh, maybe not. Oh, okay. Know. But, you know, I don't know. Check in with, with Elo. Maybe they can. I bet you they can. I <laughs> they bet can you that's a challenge something. they would welcome. <laughs> would you know, because I can see like the bartending application. I don't know why you need that. Well, I don't know. You know, you walk up to an, inter- an interactive kiosk. You want to order a uh, uh, strawberry daiquiri. And it just blends it for you right and there. And it blends it right there. Yep. It's, 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 spits it out. Yeah. yeah I don't know how Talk sanit- about a peripheral. How sanitary that is either. But okay. <laughs> uh, all right. So maybe maybe contact Elo yes. if you have ideas. There you go. customers actually need. Not Dean. <laughs> no. He may not be the best, <laughs> the best angle for that. Uh, but to learn more about Elo's Edge Connect, check out the link in the show notes or contact your Blue Star account manager.